Hello, my name is Peter Chang. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine, and today we're going to go over sterile technique and central venous catheter insertion. Uh, the first thing that you, you should be cognizant about is your setup. Okay, um, I always like to have the ultrasound machine uh, kind of opposite from where I'm standing, so I don't like it over here or back over here because if I'm doing a procedure here, I like to be looking at my site of where I'm doing the procedure and also having my ultrasound information in front of me. So you never want to be doing a procedure like this because you're blindly poking. Again, all these things should be in your field of view. Today we'll do uh, insertion of an uh, internal jugular central venous catheter and go from there. We'll go through sterile technique and all the way through the insertion of the catheter. All right, so now that we have everything set up, uh, if you're using an ultrasound, it's sometimes helpful to place a little, a little bit of lubricant. This does not need to be sterile because we're gonna put a sterile dressing over the ultrasound probe. So the, the gel does not need to be sterile at this point. Make sure your ultrasound machine is turned on and again, positioned where you would like it. Um, again, in positioning your patient, if you're doing an upper line, i.e. a subclavian, uh, triple lumen catheter or a uh, internal jugular, you want to have the patient placed in a Trendelenburg position, which means head down. Um, this is because you want to create that venous lake in the neck veins so you have a nice vessel to uh, insert your catheter into. Remember, if they're feet down, all the blood is going to pool in their legs and you're going to have a, a difficulty finding uh, the jugular vein even on ultrasound. So again, have head down a little bit. This also prevents uh, air emboli and those sorts of things when you're removing lines. So you would remove the line in the same position that you insert it in. Now that your patient's ready, usually at this point I'm a little bit OCD about cleanliness. So at this point with the patient already, what I would go ahead and do is clean them up with a chloroprep or a betadine solution. Usually in the hospital we use chlorhexidine and scrub them real good. With chlorhexidine, you do not need to use concentric circles as you do with betadine. You can just scrub all over, go back to your site. The studies have shown that that actually cleans better than using concentric circles. All right, so once we have our patient cleaned, uh, excuse me for a second, you wanna be kind to your nurses because you're going to be inserting a catheter and it may get a little bit messy and the blood will drip down on the bed. So it's always good to maybe place a chuck underneath the bed so that if and you have any blood, you know, the worst thing for a nurse is to have to clean up the entire bed after you do a line. So be nice to, to your nursing staff um, and go ahead and place a chuck underneath the patient's head. So positioning's right, ultrasound is set up, now we'll go over into sterile technique. All right. So here we have a couple of things. It depends on what kind of kit you're going to be using. This happens to be an all-inclusive kit which include some sterile flushes, uh, the drape, all your cap, gown, mask, everything that you would need to do the procedure, except your gloves. Okay, so you need sterile gloves. Of course, you're to be doing a sterile procedure. Uh, this is also kind of a jerry-rigged uh, probe cover, which we're using. Um, <clears throat> this will have to go over the ultrasound for us to be able to put it into our sterile field as it's not sterile as it is right now. And then of course you would have some sterile jelly. And of course I'm touching this now, but this would normally be under a sterile circumstance in which you would put that onto your field. Okay, so you can go ahead and open up your kit. Again, you don't have to be sterile to do this. Okay, now in the kit, you have to be cognizant that there's some flushes here that are gonna be used later on in the procedure. Okay, so you put those to the side. Uh, anytime you're doing a central line in the hospital, it's JCO requirements that you hang this sign on the door that says do not enter because you're doing a procedure under sterile uh, conditions. So once you have your kit open, remember you got to take care of yourself first, okay? So you have to do all the things that you need to do uh, to make yourself safe for the procedure. Number one is protect your eyes and of course you don't want anything falling on the field or coughing on the field of those sorts of things. So make sure you get your mask ready and go ahead and put that on before you go ahead and get sterile. Okay, it's gonna fog up every now and then, but it's just kind of breathing, pointing your breath down that prevents that from happening. And then you have a surgical cap, which anybody that's gonna be in the surgical field will need to wear. So now that you have those things set up, okay, you can go ahead and start to prepare your field. The next thing I do is I go ahead and I open up my sterile gloves. Okay, 
And you want to make sure, and this is the tough part because sometimes these little paper flaps pop back over, but you want to make sure you open it out nice and big and you pop the ends out just like that so it stays nice and open for you, okay? Again, you have another chlorhexidine wipe, which I will use in one second here. And then so go ahead and get your kit ready. So you want to go ahead and open up your kit in a place where you have a little bit more space here. So get a little bit of space. And again, the setup is the hugest part of this, the biggest part of this process. So as you open up your kit, again, you can touch inside of here, it's okay, because you still have to put on your gown. They give you an extra sterile towel here if you need it. But we'll go ahead and gown up ourselves. Now, for those that you have had uh, DCE in surgery, you know that when I was a medical student, what I did was I did like this, and I went to some of the nursing staff or surgical techs, and I would say, buckle me up. Well, if you're by yourself or in a code situation, you're going to have to do it yourself. And so again, this is not a recommended technique for the OR, but for a central line procedure, you can use this. So you can go ahead and put your, your gown down, because again, it's sterile on the inside, and get your kit ready here. Now before I go ahead and get sterile and I put on my gown, I'll open up my kit and get everything ready for me, okay? So again, just touching the corners, making sure you're not touching any of the inside, there's these nice tabs on the end which you can touch and you can see it may touch some hospital equipment but that's okay. So you have everything nice and open here. Okay, and you be sure not to touch in that field again. You can then you can just let that fall. Okay, so here's your drape and everything's all ready. At this point, I like to get the patient's drape ready. Remember, I've cleaned them at once already. The reason why I like to do that is because once you become sterile, it's very difficult as you may touch some of this remaining surfaces and you don't want to do that. So very carefully reach in and grab your sterile drape, okay? Go ahead and pull the sticky off, okay? And again, you can either do this before or after you get sterile, all right? And you're gonna, has a picture of a head here. You're gonna put that over your site Okay, and then it has some arrows, it's kind of self-explanatory that you would pull that this way. Okay, you would again pull this side to this side, pick this up and just pinch it and go here. Okay, and again you can kind of touch this part because it's not near the site. And then this part is a little bit tricky. Okay. You would peel this around this way. Remember, for a central line procedure, you're going to need to drape the entire patient, okay? Head to toe for the procedure. So the entire patient should be covered. Now, again, you don't want to touch anything in here because your side is already prepped and ready to go. Okay, so that's what the patient should look like. Sometimes it's nice to have a second hand in here just comforting the patient if they're uh, awake and not sedated. So my kit is sort of ready, and my gown is out. Now I have to make sure I put everything I need to put on this field for my procedure if I'm not going to have a second hand to hand me stuff. So you're going to be flushing your central line, so it's a good, good idea to go ahead and place your flushes there. Okay. Remember this would be our sterile probe cover, which would be sterile, so I could drop it on that field with some sterile jelly for my probe. And then at this point, too, I'll go ahead and put my chloroprep and clean the patient one last time before I start my procedure, okay? So that's there. Now my gown is ready. Mask, check. Cap, check. And so you're going to put on your gown. Now here's the trick, okay? You're going to take the gown, and you need a little bit of room to do this, okay? So you'll see this purple lining, or it may be clear, or it may be blue. And you're going to look for the tabs up front, okay? You're going to try to reach in and pull out these Velcro tabs on the inside here. Okay, once you do that, you just need a little bit of room. Okay, I'm kinda, you're kinda doing this on the fly here because there's all kinds of stuff, IV poles that you'll be kicking to the side. Once you have those tabs, you just let it fall, okay? Now again, this is if you're doing it yourself. Then you can turn around and buckle yourself, okay, behind here. Kind of hold it with one hand, and again, being sure not to touch anything in your surroundings. 
reach in with this hand okay, so your fingers poke out and then reach in from the inside here so the fingers poke out. Sometimes it may become unvelcroed. There's nothing you can do about that, especially if you're by yourself. Okay. So once you have your hands ready, you come out here and you grab your, your sterile gloves. Again, you can kind of touch the back here because that's going to be the inside of your hand. I'm right-handed, so I usually do my right hand first. You reach in here. And again, if you don't get it on perfect the first time, no big deal. Just stop right there and you'll be able to fix the glove later. The proper technique would be to insert your hand on the top of the sleeve of the second glove. Sometimes it's a little sticky in here and you pull it out. And again, if it's a little stuck, you can use your hand because again, that's all the inside of the glove. And then put this one on, okay? And again, you may not get your hand perfectly in there, but try to get your fingers and then you could reach in here Again, try not to touch any there because that's where you touched before. Once you get that, pull it over and you can see it's covering. It may not be the neatest one, but again, you're doing your procedure and the cotton around the gown is about at your wrists. Wrist, if you have it further up your hand, it makes it difficult because when you stretch your arms, the sleeve wants to pull back. So you're sterile and you're ready to go, okay? Your probe is ready, patient's gown, your kit is getting ready and you're getting ready to do your procedure. Again, I have the sterile chloro prep here, in which I won't do it on the model because it will stain, but you can kind of sort of reposition where you would want this. And remember, if you weren't sterile when you put this on, you had touched underneath side of that plastic. So that's again why I will use another sterile uh, chloro prep to kind of get where I need to get. So in this patient, probably right here is the appropriate uh, placement of the circle on the drape. At this point I would pop my chloroprep and I would scrub that side again to make sure that I'm 100% clean. All right. Now if we can kind of come back over the kit, a lot of this is in preparation for the kit. All right. So in the kit there's going to be a lot of different things. All right. And so you can kind of place some of these other things to the side. You're going to need some gauze on your field, right? Here's a tegaderm for when you're finished. Here's some suture, which you'll need. This is called a bio patch. It's an antibiotic chlorhexidine laden patch in which you put around the central line to prevent infection. All right. So I kind of get my sutures and I kind of put everything in order. So I would suture and tegaderm at the same time. So I would leave that over here and bio patch all at the same time. Now in the kit, you'll see a variety of different needles and instruments, okay? There's three sets of needles in here. One is a 22 gauge uh, lidocaine needle, so it's a very fine gauge needle in which we use to anesthetize the area. Now remember, if you're ever going to have to recap your needles, you place the cap down and do this method here and then slide it over. You never want to cap your needle like this and technically you shouldn't be recapping frequently if you can help it. If you choose to use the needle and then want to save it for later in the kit there are these foam locks which you can put the needle into. Okay. The second needle is uh, just a larger gauge needle if you need to inject lidocaine a little bit further. These are usually, I'm sorry this may be a 24 gauge, this was probably a 22 and then just go ahead and recap if you need to do that. Okay. The last needle that you'll have in your kit is your finder needle in which you will cannulate the vein. Now the trick is if you're doing an internal jugular line, okay, you're coming down the internal jugular and you're placing your wire in. So you would like the bevel of your needle to either be up or down. If you have it facing the right, there's a chance your wire may go down the right subclavian. And if you have it on the left, there's a chance that it could go across the brachiocephalic and end up on the left side, okay? So the easiest way to know in which where your bevel lies is to go ahead and do bevel up and align it with the numbers on the syringe so you know exactly where you are. Another thing is you may not want to put this on really tight because once you cannulate the vessel, you may have to remove this to pass your guide wire through and if it's too tight you may lose the vessel jostling the system around. Okay? Okay. 
Now, <coughs> we're gonna get ready to, to anesthetize the patient, but we need to prep our line first, okay? Okay, so you take the cap off of your guide wire. This is a J wire. The wire is actually constructed out of a, a piece of metal that's tightly wound in a coil. So if I was to stretch this out, it'd probably go 20 or 30 feet. Okay, and you can retract it back into the cage and then put it out. Okay, and you can see if this hits anything, it's gonna kind of bend in the direction of your J. Okay, that's why it's important to know where your bevel is placed. So you can go ahead and put your wire into the cage and get it ready, okay? The next thing you wanna do is prep your line, okay? So this is a 20 centimeter, seven French triple lumen catheter. It will have a distal port, a middle port, and a proximal port that will align and be labeled on the tubing itself, okay? It's usually two 18 gauge lines and one 16 gauge is your central. Sometimes it has these caps which are just to protect the line while it's packed. Okay, you don't have to use those again. So once you have your line ready, I go ahead and flush it. Just like when you're at the restaurant and you put your finger over your soda straw and lift it up, right? The soda stays in the straw. It's the same concept here. You're gonna screw this on, inject some saline until it squirts out the other end. And then once your syringe is still attached, you can go ahead and lock this line. That means no blood should be going into this line and you have less lines to flush and less chance of your line clotting off. Again, the white port, go ahead and flush it out and then lock it. The most important thing is not to really lock the central port because that's the, the port in which your wire will be going into it. So if you lock this one, the wire won't be able to go through. So I don't even flush that one because the wire is going to be going through it and push out whatever I put in it anyway. So your line's ready, okay? Catheter's ready. You have a dilator in which you will dilate the vessel uh, once you attain vascular access from your finder needles. Okay, so that goes over here. And then you have a, a small scalpel in which you'll make a little stab at the skin actually before you dilate, so that gives you a track to dilate. So all these things you'll need. Now, I was never really, in my education, I was never really explained what this is, and this is called an angiocath. Okay, and it's actually a small needle, and it has a plastic covering over it. It kind of almost looks like an arterial line. If most of the difficulty in then placing a central line is actually not cannulating the vessel, it's passing your guide wire. And so if you get any tension or you feel like something's going on that shouldn't be, you can always try and take off this larger gauge needle and hook this up to your syringe and try to cannulate the vessel. And once you do, pass this line into it. Now, once that line is in the vessel, you can see it's a lot easier to pass the wire through this than it would be a hard needle, okay? So this is a very useful tool. Of course, you always have to be cognizant that if you hit any resistance, you worry about stenosis in the vessel and you also worry about a clot being there. So that's when the ultrasound is really useful in identifying to see if it's a good spot to put a line or even use the angiocast. So you always be careful before you use it that nothing is obstructing the vessel. So you're all ready to go, okay? Again, okay, you have also some clamps here. If you're doing a line on an 80 year old lady that's five foot, then you may need to secure the line at a point that's lower than the deepest point on the line. So it has this little butterfly attachment that goes over and you would just secure the line there and then this is a lock and this will lock the catheter in this place and you would of course stitch this to the patient and I usually throw a stitch and wind it through here in case this gets tugged on it's anchored at that initial stitch and so again this is only for your patients with smaller stature um, so the line is not into the right ventricle causing uh, ectopy. All right, so we're getting ready to, to begin our procedure, okay? Now we need to draw up our lidocaine to numb our patient, all right? Now some people have been cut by breaking the lidocaine bottle, so sometimes it's good to go ahead and use this, uh, the gauze, to kind of break the glass cap on your lidocaine, okay? In here, you also are giving a transducer probe in which you can aspirate fluid, okay? So 
So sometimes if it's a little bit stuck, just go ahead and grab one of your syringes right here. Just screw it on and it should pop right out. Now I can go ahead and aspirate. And again, this is not a sharp needle, so you don't have to worry about poking yourself. And you can aspirate your lidocaine. And I try to fill it up as high as it'll go, okay? And then again, this is still sort of a sharp, so you should lock it here. And then go ahead and get your needle ready. Okay, so our kit's fully explained and ready to go. The last thing we need to do is identify the vessel under ultrasound. Now again, I'll have to make some apologies as this is not a real ultrasound probe. They're kind of rolled up in plastic here and you will see a picture of a hand. Your hand kind of goes into that attachment there, okay, and as this rolls out, okay, it's basically going to surround your probe cover. And again, my hand would really be inside of that probe all the way but I'll have to kind of flip it around for a second. Okay, and put this over the probe. Okay. All right, so I can touch here now. And again, hopefully that probe kind of falls in there, but I can't be guaranteed. Okay. Dr. Sloan could probably help me here. He could probably trim some of this out. Alright, again, usually it's not this difficult in reality. <laughs> I'm just going to say that that's where we're at, okay, as far as our probe, and this is a, a probe cover, and that's kind of what it will look like. Okay. I'm going to get it nice and tight around your probe, and then that's sterile now, so you can go ahead and place that on your field, okay? okay. And there should be a little bit of gel in there, okay, to kind of help with the process to eliminate air, because remember, air is the enemy of, of the ultrasound machine. All right, and so you're ready to go. So let's get some sterile gel here, and place it on our patient in the site that you believe the uh, internal jugular vein lies. Remember, you have two heads to your sternocleidomastoid muscle, right? One is a clavicular head, and one is a sternal head, and it kind of makes a triangle here. Remember, the internal jugular vein kind of lies at the apex of that triangle. And according to an unguided procedure, you're going to insert your needle and aim towards the nipple on the same side, ipsilateral nipple, kind of at that apex. Okay, but we have the luxury of having ultrasound machines, which definitely decreases the risk of uh, complications for our patients. The next thing I like to do again is get some good jelly on here and identify which side you're on. This is my left and I, this is the left side of the probe on the ultrasound machine. That's the easiest way. There may be some other techniques, but that's the way that I like to do it because if I'm too far right, I know I need to go left. All right, and we try to identify the vessel there. Okay. Again, the inter internal jugular vein, right? should technically be lateral to the artery. Both of these are compressible on the model, but I would probably say that this, since it does lie more medially, would be the artery and this would be the vein. Okay, and the vein is gonna be nice and compressible as that picture is there, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Now you can turn the probe longitudinally okay and get a cross-sectional view of the vessel as you see right there and so you could you could identify the uh, vein either in a longitudinal or a transverse cut all right so I know my vessel is kind of right around here I would go ahead and kind of mentally mark on that spot and I again I won't inject the model with lidocaine but you go in there and make a nice wheel and remember the vein in a thin person only lies about a half a centimeter down so you don't want to be going too deep with this this is just uh, a superficial anesthetic so the patient doesn't feel the man manipulation of the line okay so I pretend and the patient's all numbed up and I'm ready to go now before you know the needle kind of hits the skin and I should have said this before I numbed it you would of course do something called a timeout okay that would be sterile procedure. You're about to break the skin. You would call your nurse in, identify the patient and the site and the name of the procedure and make sure you're doing it on the right side. So you have to time out every time or else bad things can happen. And um, 
if you end up doing a procedure on the wrong side incidentally you're going to have a very difficult time getting a medical license in florida unfortunately so the importance of the timeout is paramount and i really should have done that before i anesthetized or numbed the patient so i'm getting ready to go ahead and insert my catheter all right now we'll just switch spots here again so you can kind of see a little bit of both and you may want to come right over my shoulder so you can get a little view of both and what's happening here and on the screen so again align your bevels with your number okay that way you know exactly where things are going you kind of want to have it up or down okay <coughs> you would identify the vessel on the ultrasound again identifying your side here okay all right so sorry for the poor view here and again you would go in right here and look for your vessel and I'm in already you can see the needle tip okay and I'm getting blue blood which is on this model venous blood and you can actually see if I if Dr. Sloan can focus in on the screen the tip of my needle kind of moving side to side and like I said some of these things really aren't that deep so once you've identified the vessel it's holding it very still okay and then getting your guide wire now with the arrow kits you have an option of not disconnecting your needle from your syringe and passing your guide wire directly down the hole of this but it's a little bit harder because there's a lot of tension in the wire and I, I don't believe you can really accurately assess so I kind of brace my hand against the patient here and again it's a little bit difficult if they're squirming around but you want to go ahead and you'll see a nice flow of blood coming out you really shouldn't see a pulsation because then you'd be in the artery and remember as your bevel you want your uh, J tip, J wire to either be pointed up or down. You don't want it to be pointed to left or right. So in this scenario, it's probably easier to put my J wire in the up position. And it's a little bit tough because you got gel on your hands and so forth. Now, some of the difficulties in passing the wire is again, these things are slippery. So what I usually do is pull out a little bit. I'll clamp the wire with my thumb and then push in. Okay. Now we don't need to insert this too far in this model. Now on the wire, okay, you never want to technically let go of the wire as long as it's in the body, okay. If you look on this, you'll see little hash marks or gradations. This is the 30 centimeter mark, the 20 centimeter mark, and of course the 5 would be a little bit ahead. Kind of holding the wire and study a little bit, you could pass it a little bit further, pull the needle out, and then clamp the wire here and then pull this out, okay. Now again, for purposes in which we can't dilate and insert the line on this model, I'll just talk about the steps because the silicone. Go ahead and do it. Okay, all right. Um, so the next step would be to go ahead and make a nick in the skin, okay? So in this case, I would take my scalpel about a half, quarter inch to half inch out and make a stab right there against the skin where my wire inserts, okay? Once that's done, I can go ahead and dilate. <coughs> Excuse me, now the way I do this is I'll loop the wire around, hold it here with my pinky, and then grasp with my thumb. So I have the wire in two different places and I'm not trying to thread something out way out on my field. And I'll go ahead and insert that into my dilator. Once it sticks out the other end, you can let go of everything. Okay, and then you would just gently dilate. And remember, like I said, you saw how quick I got into the vein so you don't need to drive this dilator all the way to the hub you just want it using a twisting motion go into the vessel right just so you dilate you probably can go maybe about a quarter way just twist it around a little bit on coming out okay make sure you kind of anchor your wire so when you pull this out you're not pulling out your wire and your dilator just your dilator once the dilator comes out you want to have some gauze ready because you just poked a hole in somebody's jugular vein and they're gonna bleed. So go ahead, and again, I like to kind of secure my wire so it's not flopping around hitting everything. Go ahead and grab your central line, and I kind of sort of do the same thing. I'll loop this around, I'm holding onto my wire. Again, you can even leave your gauze here if the patient's still bleeding. Anchor it here, and then grab 
your triple lumen catheter and insert it through the central port. And it's just feeding this in here, okay? Okay. And wait for the wire to come out the black the back of the middle port. Okay, you can see the wire right here. So I can go ahead and grab this wire, okay? And then I can go ahead and insert it into the patient, okay? Kind of have to use a little bit of force, kind of push it in, and of course if you feel resistance, go ahead and stop. Now again, I don't want to insert this too far into the model. Normally, this will go all the way down between the junction of your superior vena cava and your right atrium. There's a few reasons for that. I explained one of them earlier. If it's too far in, you can cause ventricular or atrial ectopy and elicit VTAC, which we don't want to do. And the second thing is, you don't want to have the catheter too far out because if you're infusing caustic substances, either chemotherapies, pressors, those sorts of things that are caustic to the body, you can actually cause sclerosis of the superior vena cava and cause SVC syndrome Pete, later on. You can go ahead and insert this one, that's fine. Okay. Oh, I think that's about as far as it goes. So there's a little bit of tension. Okay. So the line's a little bit. So go ahead and once you're in there and you kind of secure here, go ahead and pull your wire out. Okay. Now, normally, how far would you insert that catheter? If it was on me, of course, I'm six foot yep. five, I would go all the way to the 20 centimeters. Okay. If this was, a, again, an 80 year old woman, I'd probably insert it to 16 or 17. My rule is I can always pull it out a little bit more. I don't like to push it in just because this is in the external environment and can pick up bugs. So I always like to go estimate a little bit further and if I need to, pull it back. Okay, at this point, you can suture down your line, okay, however you guys choose to. I know you guys have been attending some suture clinics, right? Yeah, th now, they may not have, so you go okay. ahead and, and, and just show them what to do here. All right. So, <coughs> or at least your technique. So, I would kind of hold the line here, and again, you just want to make sure that that doesn't fly out since it's not secured, okay? Go ahead and open up your sutures, okay? And you peel it back and you'll expose the corner and again this is where most sticks happen okay is during suturing okay just grab it and pull your suture out okay at this point you know you want to take big bites and so this is kind of uh, you know uncomfortable for an awake patient but what you can do is always you have some extra lidocaine over there you can always numb them up if you want um, so again you want to take a nice big bite into the patient, right, and then guide it up through, okay, and then you can use the tip of your needle, and when I lock my needle, you can see where I locked it, that the sharp end is still in the clamp, right, and then so once you have that in place, then you can go ahead and perform a tie, okay, and I usually use the silly internal medicine ties, because I'm not a surgeon, um, I use an instrument tie, okay, so you can go ahead and place your needle over here, you wrap two or three times, grab the tip, and then pull down, okay, and again, grab two or three times, grab the tip, and then pull it down, make sure it's nice and stug, snug, and you can always do an extra one if you're ever weary, get it nice and snug, and then go ahead, you have your scalpel, go ahead and cut the ends, and again, just be wary not to cut yourself or injure the patient. Always cut away from yourself. Okay? You would snip that and then again do the same thing on the cor corresponding side. Remember, this is a sharp, so be careful as you rest it back on your feel. Last thing you would of course do after the line is secured is <coughs> I uh, kind of got a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, before I would secure the line, I would flush it, right? So you'd make sure that you're getting a good return of nice blue fluid, right? And then you would flush, okay? And then you can lock it. And then again, these don't necessarily need flushing, but that central port does. <coughs> and then um, I would put my bio patch on. Okay, and it'll tell you on this side which side is up. So the blues to the sky, if you always remember that way. Slide that over. Okay, and then at this point, the line is secure, right? You've flushed it, everything's good. You're getting ready to, to put a tegaderm on it. The easiest way to do it is just lift this up over the patient here, 
And at this point, the patient's relieved that you're done, and then go ahead and grab your tegaderm and some gauze. Make sure you dry up the area well, because you can't stick tape to something that's wet. And again, this line would be in a little bit further. And then you would place your tegaderm over it. I always like to fold it with the crease of the neck, okay? And kind of follow the contours of the catheter in, okay? So it's a little bit more comfortable for the patient. And try to leave this out. It really is poor form if you have it hanging up by their ear up there. So and then once you do that, just go ahead and uh, peel the rest of your tegaderm off. Okay. Okay. And then the next thing you would do, <coughs> excuse me, is call for a stat chest x-ray to confirm placement of your line at the junction of the superior vena cava and right atrium. Right? And also with uh, internal jugular lines and uh, subclavian lines. Another risk, of course, when you explain to your patients during the consent process is bleeding, infection, and pneumothorax. So you want to be looking closely. If this was a right internal jugular line, when you do your chest x-ray, look closely at the apex of the right lung and make sure that there's no uh, pneumothorax there. Okay, And then again, that also confirms placement. And then you can give your clearance to use your line and run whatever you'd like to through it.